Yeah, my name is Nathan Bronson. Uh, I worked for about 10 years at, at Facebook on some of their infrastructure, and uh, for the past three years, I've been uh, working at Roxet. So uh, what I want to do is uh, talk today about, uh, like partly about Roxet specifically, but also about some of the design principles that we've used uh, in order to solve the problem of uh, doing real-time search and analytics in the cloud and fully taking advantage of the cloud. So uh, the thing that we're trying to build uh, is this kind of question mark box. Uh, we have some sort of uh, streaming records and, and or is, this could be like events from an event stream. This could be uh, CDC from some sort of a database capture. Um, and then we want to we want to uh, materialize these into a database that can that can run SQL queries. And there's a, a variety of queries that we want to do for search and uh, real time analytics. We have search like queries. So this is something where we have a very uh, a very constraining where clause. Uh, we want to be able to run high QPS. We want to be able to get uh, like uh, measure tens of milliseconds for our query latency. Uh, this could be a vector search where we're doing uh, some sort of approximate nearest neighbor ranking. Um, and it can also be real-time analytics, where we have uh, where it's more of an analytics-style query. We still have a bunch of joins. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, we want to see the data uh, as soon as it gets ingested without any, without any delay. Um, so we want like sub-millisecond ingest latency. And we also uh, want the queries to be fast. So in this kind of search and analytics space, it's actually fairly common to directly connect uh, the, uh, the, the queries into the user interface. So there's actually a person at the end waiting. We want them to be very fast. And of course, uh, these are the kind of different categories of queries, but an individual query actually probably combines all three. Like if you have a search query uh, and you want to run over, uh, like being able to do a join with some of the data means that you don't have to denormalize everything ahead of time, which is an enormous advantage, uh, both in terms of your data footprint and in your product flexibility. Um, vector search is often combined with uh, exact search. Like you want to find uh, not only the matching product, but the matching product that's in stock at the store near you. Uh, and then real-time analytics, uh, the selective parts of these queries benefit from the same kind of inverted index that we use to make uh, search queries go fast. So of course, the, the question mark box here is Roxette. Roxette uh, does all these things. Um, but I want to talk about kind of the pressures that, uh, that shape the architecture that any system that, that solves this use case uh, has to confront. So uh, the first challenge is, uh, is scalability. So we're going to need some sort of sharding. Like the, the data footprints that we're using are not something that fits in a single machine or can be processed by a single machine with the latency requirements that we want. Um, this is a pretty large space. There's, a, there's probably like more ways of sharding than there are databases in the world. Uh, but we can kind of subdivide this into a few possibilities. Um, so uh, the first question is whether, whether the documents can change. Um, there's plenty of systems out there that have like immutable documents. They kind of come in and then they live and then, uh, then they maybe are doing time-based reclamation later. Um, but for most of the use cases that we've seen, uh, this isn't really adequate to support the application or not. It's, uh, maybe there's some workaround, but it's, it's not very good. Uh, and also, uh, it might be a little unintuitive, but having immutable documents actually makes it hard to do a real-time database because uh, one of the core functions of a lot of, a lot of these use cases is to do some sort of aggregation or roll-up at ingest time. So if you have an immutable data store and you want to do one minute averages, then you have to sit on the data for one minute until, uh, until you know what the average is before you can put it in the data store. Um, if you have a mutable data store in the back, uh, then you can actually like, uh, kind of incrementally update your, uh, the, the record in the database, and that makes the, the values immediately visible to the query side. So if we really want to do a real-time uh, real system like this, we're going to want to have mutable records. Uh, the next big question is whether you uh, use the values in the record to decide uh, which shard the, the record lives on, or or whether it's uh, or whether it's kind of independent of that. So a lot of systems uh, use uh, some sort of clustering in order to to allocate where the data is located. Um, this gives you opportunities to do larger read IOs because if you have some sort of uh, predicate on your query, then all the data that that matches that predicate will be near each other. Um, it actually doesn't uh, change, at least to a first order approximation, it doesn't change the amount of data you have to read. It just means that the data happens to all be next to each other. So you get to do fewer IOs, which is kind of pretty beneficial for the bottom of the system. Uh, the challenge here, though, is that uh, because the, the data is mutable and we're making this, this value independent uh, data mapping, that means that the data items might actually move around as you do ingest. So the coordination overheads required to do streaming ingest uh, start to get really out of hand. So if you look at a system like this in, and you read the, the documentation about how data comes in, you'll find the word batch. 
uh, somewhere. Um, and, and kind of as the batch uh, sizes get smaller, uh, then things get, things get worse in terms of the coordination overheads and the complexity uh, in the back end. The alternative is um, that we can uh, put all the data and the indexes together on a single shard and make that shard be chosen using the identity of the document rather than the values in it. Um, so this is known in the search world as doc sharding. Um, you just, uh, you put all of your data, you kind of like randomly spread it around between the shards. Uh, the challenge, uh, the, the, the primary challenge with this is that now that we, we have to do smaller reads and we'll do more of them, but if we can solve that challenge, then we get a whole bunch of cascading benefits. We get uh, efficient streaming ingest because now all of the work of ingest is something that happens in a single machine or actually even a single thread potentially. So we don't have a coordination and, and contention overheads. Um, and it means uh, this, this benefit for uh, reducing the coordination overheads actually uh, extends to the query time as well, because now it's really easy to get a consistent view of the index, because even in read time, we're also operating uh, within a single consistency domain when we, when we access the data and, uh, and access the indexes. So if we can solve this challenge of small read IOs, then uh, this, this has cascading benefits for the rest of the system. So we'll go back and we'll say, okay, um, if we're looking to get scalability with sharding, we can revise that statement and say, we'll use doc sharding and that gives us scalability and uh, the ability to do efficient streaming ingest with these kind of uh, more complicated index types. Um, so the next challenge is the, the one that we use for the title of the talk, um, which is that uh, if you have a single, a single uh, a virtual machine in the cloud that's running your ingest process and your query process, um, then you don't have a CPU isolation between them. So uh, if somebody, uh, if there's a whole bunch of data that arrives suddenly, then that may affect your query uh, uh, your query latencies. And because these queries are, are very latency sensitive, that's a big problem. Uh, so in the world of, uh, of, of uh, boxes and arrows, this is a really easy problem to solve. You just add a second set of boxes and put an arrow between them and you send the ingest on one side and the queries on the other side. Uh, the challenge, of course, if you actually want to build the system is that now the uh, getting the updates from the ingest worker to the query worker needs to be something that's very lightweight because uh, otherwise, we're basically just redoing all the work of ingest uh, as part of our replication process. So I've, I've illustrated that here with a, the pie chart. So I've got like uh, the yellow pie chart uh, for the left side shows that almost all the work of going to the ingest work. And then the, we get mostly a green pie chart on the right. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit more details about how we actually do this kind of efficient post, post ingest replication uh, inside Rockset. Um, but if you can figure this out, then uh, this gives you a lot of uh, really nice properties in terms of isolation. Of course, there's no reason to only have uh, one box on the right side here. Um, what you really, like, we, we want uh, the ability to have isolation also between uh, different applications or different workloads. Um, this is what Rockset calls compute-compute separation, where we have, like, uh, we can separate out the, and isolate the compute for uh, the ingest processing and then also for uh, one or more applications. And each of these, uh, each of these uh, uh, clusters or units of shards also can be scaled, uh, scaled vertically by adding more fewer, fewer nodes. So this gives us a lot of elasticity. Um, you can shut down one of these clusters at night and then bring it back up the next day. Um, if you want to run some sort of an analytic query in the background, you can spin up a, a we call these a virtual instance in our UI. Um, you can spin up a cluster and then run your, your long-lived query against it uh, without having any impact on the latency for your, uh, for your, like, your real-time uh, front-end use case. So the next problem that happens, um, you can kind of see every time I cut and pasted this thing, uh, I got a new copy of the database, uh, which means that the, the storage footprint of this uh, is growing. Um, so this is, uh, there's obviously a cost, uh, a cost associated with that. Um, this also actually directly uh, reduces elasticity because if you actually have to download the data in order to be able to, uh, to run queries, then that, that puts like a 10 or 20 minute process in the, in the critical path of doing any sort of uh, scaling or, uh, or uh, uh, online, like, uh, like bringing, on, bringing up a new cluster. Uh, it also impacts fail, uh, failure recovery, which is kind of very, like failure recovery is almost kind of a type of elasticity. You're trying to get a new machine back online quickly. Uh, so the solution to this is to use uh, disaggregated storage. Uh, we take all the data that's the, the, the large footprint of the data uh, for the database and we put it in some sort of a separate service that is accessible from all the workers. So the, the uh, the ingest process needs to write to this, and then everybody else gets to read from it. Um, it didn't fit on the slide, but this really should kind of say uh, disaggregated and deduplicated storage. So what we want is we want to make sure that even though all of these different uh, workers have uh, instances of the database open, they all get to use byte-identical files in the back end. And if we can do that, 
Um, like we have to be really careful about all of our, all of our uh, replication in order to do that. But once we do that, um, then we get this uh, really beneficial uh, uh, scalability and, and elasticity because we can now just uh, quickly move uh, instances from one, like a, a compute instance from one machine to another, or we can like spread the spread the shards across a, a larger number of machines, and we don't have to move all the data. And as we bring up additional compute, we don't have to make extra copies of the data. This also provides a lot of efficiency in the storage because it's easier to fill the disks up. Uh, we have an indirection layer, which means we we can uh, grow and shrink things without actually having to move the files around. Whereas if you actually if you try to like um, put data on uh, disks that are mounted only by a single machine, then when you want to change that mapping, you have to move it from one uh, disk to another. Um, that applies even if you're using something like EBS uh, uh, relative to direct attached uh, disks. Okay, so um, if you remember before, uh, we talked about the, uh, the need to be able to do efficient small reads. So this kind of has an implication on what kind of storage uh, technology we can use for the disaggregated layer. Um, so the spectrum, like the, the two things that dominate here are either a, uh, a cold storage, like a blob store, like AWS S3, um, or a hot storage where we have uh, flash. Um, and this could either be like uh, EBS mounted on something, or you can actually just get instances that have large disks attached, like an i3 EM. Um, the, um, and then I guess there's kind of a spectrum here if you use a hot storage, uh, if you use SSDs as a cache for cold storage. Um, so S3 is an absolutely amazing product in terms of its, uh, in terms of how cheap it is for the durability uh, guarantees that you get. Like it's almost impossible to build something that actually has the same durability as S3 for anywhere close to the price. Um, it's uh, quite cheap per as a, as a dollar per gigabyte. Uh, in, in this particular use case, it's also convenient because it has a built-in uh, remote procedure call uh, system. Like it's it's a service, which means that any uh, there's uh, all of our workers can just send requests to read from S3 and. Uh, S3 will automatically handle that. Um, the downside is that it's uh, that it has high or unpredictably high latency. So the the latency of a single call to S3 is actually like larger than our uh, tail latency budget for a lot of the, the Rockset use cases. So we can't go to S3 during a query uh, uh, and still meet our our latency goals. It also is uh, fairly expensive per IOP. Um, if you if you think of a GET request as a single IOP, so those IOPs can be enormous. Like you can request. Like, like 60 gigabytes in one request if you want. Um, but uh, if, you're, if you're requesting small things like a page size, then the, uh, the 40 nano dollars per, uh, per get actually starts to add up. And you'll find that uh, if you're doing small reads at relatively high, uh, high QPS, it's actually cheaper to have data in Flash than it is on S3. Um, it, depends on your, it depends on your workload. Um, on the Flash side of things, um, we get uh, a cheaper uh, dollar per IOP. We get kind of reliably low latency. Um, there's no RPC service included, which is kind of an advantage and a disadvantage in, in our case. Um, it's a disadvantage because uh, now you need to actually provision a machine to run the service. Um, if, you, if you get uh, like an i3 EN instance, you get kind of the CPUs for free. Um, but if you want to use EBS, then you have to like also get an EC2 instance. Um, but because you built the own, your own RPC service, you can make it as elaborate and complicated and tailored to your use case as you want. Um, so you get a lot of control. Um, and then the downside, like, uh, Hot storage is better in essentially every way except uh, that it's more expensive as a dollar per gigabyte. That's why we don't use it everywhere. So um, because of the latency goals of Rockset, Rockset uh, spends its time kind of on the, the hot side of this uh, design trade-off. So let's go back and, and look at our kind of top level points and then we can actually relate these to, to some of the, the, the terms that Rockset uses to describe itself. So we've made a design choice to have uh, dock sharding with indexes. Um, so we call this converged indexing, and this gets us, uh, the, the sharding gets us scalability, and uh, the, uh, the fact that we're doing dock sharding gives us the ability to efficiently do streaming ingests, despite the fact that we have these relatively complicated indexes. Um, the post-ingest replication, the ability to light, light, uh, have a lightweight way of replicating the work of ingest from one, uh, one computer to another, is what we call compute-compute separation. So this, uh, uh, this gives us isolation between the ingest side and the and the query application side, and then also isolation between uh, uh, different applications. And then the disaggregated hot storage is the core of compute storage separation. Um, it gives us high disk utilization, which helps reduce the cost. It gives us compute elasticity, because we can move compute without moving the data. And it gets us storage elasticity, because we can um, easily add capacity without having to rearrange things. So now I want to uh, dig a little bit deeper into uh, how we've actually implemented these things at Rockset. So I'm going to make, make the the two uh, 
the two things more concrete. Um, and the first is the, the post-ingest replication. So inside Rockset, if you look inside, um, one Rockset shard basically corresponds to one RocksDB instance. So RocksDB is an embedded database. You can have, uh, it's a C++ library, you link against it. So it's, it's feasible to have many uh, Rockset, uh, sorry, RocksDB database instances open even inside a single process. Like it's, it's pretty lightweight. People run it on the phone all the time. Well, I guess phones are not lightweight anymore, but. Um, so inside RocksDB, RocksDB is a, uh, a log structured merge tree. So this means that it, uh, when you make changes to it, it buffers those changes in a mem table, which is a, it's a, a it's actually a skip list internally. Um, and then once the mem table fills up, so maybe 64 megabytes of stuff, uh, we write this out as a, uh, in sorted order to a, to a file on disk. And the files that live on disk, uh, SST files, uh, are, uh, they're relatively large. They're like about 64 megs each, and they're also uh, immutable, they never change. Uh, which actually makes it a lot easier to build a hot storage layer. Um, the consistency, uh, solving consistency problems for immutable data is much easier than uh, for mutable data. So, uh, RocksDB provides a key value interface, uh, and you can, so you can, uh, you can access things by key, or you can kind of, uh, like, iterate in sorted order across the keys, but it doesn't provide higher level things like SQL or, uh, or anything like that. Um, so, uh, Rockset has a relatively complicated mapping between the input documents and uh, the, the RocksDB keys underneath. Um, so, Rockset is a, uh, accepts data that's in an unstructured format. Um, so, if you have structure, we take advantage of it from, uh, from an efficiency standpoint, but you can also just send in like JSON objects from Mongo or something like that. In fact, some of our, some of our customers uh, use Rockset because they didn't, uh, they like the power of SQL, but they didn't really plan ahead of time for being able to do that. Like we give them a relational model on top of data that's not kind of structured in a relational way. Um, so if you take a particular document that comes in, um, we, we build several, uh, several, there's several kind of footprints of this inside RocksDB. So one of them is what we call a search optimized store. This is an inverted index. So if, for example, a, a document has uh, 10 kind of primitive values somewhere inside it, each one of those will end up being, uh, will, will cause there to be an entry in the posting list for the inverted index for that value. Um, this lets us, like for example, if you select um, uh, all of those students that had a particular birthday, uh, instead of having to scan all of, uh, all of that, we're actually just gonna read that, uh, read the matching rows directly off of uh, an inverted list, you know, a posting list in an inverted index. Um, but this means that there'll be like quite a few deltas that come out of an individual JSON object uh, for that index. So we also have uh, a scan optimized store. So this is uh, a single RocksDB key here will actually store uh, perhaps uh, 4,000 values of a column for, for 4,000 different documents. Um, this lets us amortize the costs of RocksDB when we're doing uh, heavy scans. Um, but it means that when we, uh, it, that we call this the, the columnar store. So we have kind of a, a clustered columnar store. So um, this means that when we, when we do an update, we also have deltas to those. RocksDB provides an API that lets you uh, kind of apply these deltas lazily, which means we don't have to like read and write the entire uh, column block. Uh, otherwise, that would be prohibitively uh, inefficient. Um, and then we also have a, a document store where we store kind of the, um, every column uh, all, all put together. So if you've been using an inverted index and you, uh, and you have found the set of documents that actually match, uh, you often or almost always want to go find a bunch of other column values that, that do the match. You're not just like select all the birthdays where birthday equals whatever. You want to like get the names and stuff like that. So to, for doing that, we can efficiently go to the document store and get them all in one IO. Um, and the document store also uh, makes it easier uh, to handle corner cases like extremely large strings or, or that kind of stuff. So the end result of this is that um, you can think of the ingest process in, in a system like this that uses uh, kind of a variety of index formats as a way of turning a single logical update into a set of physical deltas. So in our case, the physical deltas are the kind of the byte deltas that are gonna be applied into, uh, into the Rocks, RocksDB key values. Um, and there's a bunch of physical deltas that come out of one, uh, uh, out of, out of one uh, logical uh, thing. And uh, it turns out that uh, in our case, there's about an order of magnitude difference between the uh, cost of computing the physical deltas and the cost of applying them. So if we take those physical deltas and actually uh, build a replication pipeline that lets them go across, uh, then we can apply them in the mem table of a different RocksDB instance with about uh, one-tenth the, the CPU work uh, that it took to actually construct those deltas to begin with. Um, 
There's also additional things, like the followers don't need to run compaction. Um, so uh, the leader will send metadata across this replication stream, just say like, okay, you should stop using those files and start using these. But it doesn't actually have to do the work itself. It doesn't even have to do the work of writing any files because, the, because we've been carefully matching up all the sequence numbers. And so the files that would have been written by the, by the leader happen to be byte identical to the files that would have been written by the follower. So the follower just skips that step and starts using the files that showed up in the disaggregated uh, storage layer. Um, this compute compute separation also uh, is the way that we uh, handle uh, real time AI uh, compute compute separation for real time AI. So the leader is the one that has to do the work of like uh, finding the Voronoi cells in the uh, in the embedding space, and uh, the followers get to treat uh, uh, approximate nearest neighbor work as somebody has given me a function that lets me translate uh, vectors into uh, into a, a smaller uh, cardinality domain, and then I have an inverted index on top of that. Um, so uh, we can put all of the work of actually doing, like constructing the uh, constructing this mapping on the leaders, and also the work of uh, making sure that the, uh, the the inverted index portion of this of this lookup step uh, is is updated. Um, the end result of this, uh, because because this particular style of doing uh, doing uh, uh, A and N. Looks uh, looks a lot like a, a real time. I'm uh, sorry, like a like an inverted index. Um, we can actually do streaming updates to this as well. So uh, we uh, the uh, the map like the Voronoi decomposition into the into the space doesn't have to change every time, but we can incrementally change the vectors on a on a particular entry uh, in in real time. So with uh, like sub second latency. Um, so if, for example, you want to recategorize one of the rows, then uh, it'll immediately uh, benefit from the recategorization. Okay, um, so now I want to uh, talk a little bit about how we built the uh, the shared hot storage system, this disaggregated storage layer. Um, so I've already mentioned how uh, RocksDB is a log structured merge tree. So if you look at the read and write pattern that happens here, um, so we have uh, writes going are buffered in in RAM in whatever order they arrive, uh, although we, we maintain the order with the skip list. Um, and then once we have a big block of these, we write it out to a file. And uh, because each of these files kind of contains uh, keys from the whole space and they might contain new values, we need to eventually kind of uh, merge in order to, to uh, make the, the read time uh, easier. So this process is called compaction, where we take it, we read in a, a set of files and we sort them and remove, uh, remove overwritten values and, and deleted things. And then we write them back out um, and create a, a new set of SSD files. So if you think about this process, um, we're doing big writes of immutable data, and these writes are not even, uh, they're not even really synchronous. Like, uh, there's, if, even if it took like one second or two seconds to do these writes, it doesn't actually stop the system from ingesting new data and making it visible to users. The read side is actually pretty different though. Um, so uh, Rockset has a, a cost-based query optimizer. So if we go to the column scan, then we're generating relatively large reads. Um, we'll be pulling uh, uh, these, these kind of like, chunks out of the column store, but we're also going to be scanning a bunch of those chunks quickly uh, in a row. And they have, they have good locality because of the sorting properties. Um, but if we end up going to do an index lookup, then we might actually get a bunch of, uh, a bunch of smaller IOs needed to, to fetch the additional columns. So we're going to kind of point things. So um, the, the first case is you're doing large reads and you're bandwidth limited. Like that's, um, that's kind of like the easy, easy mode for building a disaggregated store. Uh, the, the harder mode is when you have to do small reads and you're latency limited and you're IOPS limited. So this is the challenge that we face. The trick is, um, or the, the simplifying insight, uh, is that uh, we don't actually need small writes or fast writes. We only need big, slow writes, and we need small, fast reads. So we can write to, SS, uh, to S3 and get our durability, um, so long as we can read from, uh, read from Flash. So uh, the overall architecture ends up looking something like this. So when, a, when we uh, want to flush a mem table, we, we put that object into S3. That gives us durability. And then we download it uh, into uh, the shared hot storage layer. And once we've done that, then we can efficiently do small reads using, uh, we actually use gRPC for that uh, kind of a bespoke, a bespoke thing. Um, because it's our own thing, we get to implement a fat client, which means we can actually uh, uh, get a lot of, like, we get uh, fewer hops and uh, better availability than we would get if we had to like expose this as a as a, a simple with a simple client. Um, 
And uh, we found that we can actually saturate the disk bandwidth of the, uh, of the SSDs in this bottom layer, um, even with, with very small reads, like 4K reads or 8K reads. If you tune, if you tune the communication, like the, the RPC layer, then you can get that to happen. Um, obviously, the, the latency is not quite as low as if the disks were directly attached, um, but it's definitely low enough that we uh, don't have to do kind of elaborate pipelining in order to like, saturate the throughput. So that layer kind of looks like a cache. Um, if you were thinking of S3 as the durability and then the, the, the flash as the, uh, as the thing that lets us get hot reads, um, that, that's, that's kind of what caches are. Um, the challenge here is that we're now actually, like, the, there's an enormous performance difference between getting a cache hit and a cache miss. Um, it's actually up to like 1,000 a thousand, a thousand x. We can get like a 400, uh, 400 microsecond hit to our disag layer, but uh, that's not uh, S3. So there's a bunch of reasons why you get cache misses. Um, so what Rockset has done is we've actually just kind of enumerated all of them and, uh, and uh, put in techniques in place to reduce them. So a cold miss is when you access data that has never been ac accessed before. Uh, it's kind of the, the hardest case for a cache. Uh, no matter how intelligent your caching algorithm is, if it's only reacting to requests, it always gets cold misses on the first time. We have capacity misses, which are what happens when your cache is too small and you have to throw stuff away. Uh, it, in, in, uh, in operating this thing, there's also a significant number of cache misses, or these are kind of like, uh, they're, they're cold misses, but they're, they're kind of like uh, cold misses that you shouldn't have taken. Like, they wouldn't, wouldn't have been cold misses in an ideal scenario, which is if you've had to do like a, a process restart because of an upgrade, or maybe you migrated from one machine to another, um, if you resize the cluster so the place that the data is supposed to be kind of changes, or if you're doing some sort of failure recovery, um, these are all scenarios also where you, uh, you might get a cache miss. Um, so we've basically just gone through and very carefully addressed each one of these. We've been, got rid of cold misses by doing a synchronous prefetch, and then also by, um, uh, in case we missed the, the, the synchronous prefetch, we also list from S3, um, so we get kind of a, a, double, uh, a double chance of that one. Um, we do cluster auto-scaling to avoid capacity problems. We, uh, we've actually, so because all of the data that actually matters is on disk, we actually uh, wrote the disag layer so that it's uh, kind of dual-headed. So you can actually spin up two different, uh, two different processes that are both managing the same set of files, and either one of them will get them, get, give them to you because they're actually just interfacing through POSIX. Um, so this means that when we do a roll, we actually start up the new process and then wait until all the traffic is moved to it and all the requests are drained from the old one and all the configs are consistent before we drain the old one. That gets rid of uh, cache misses from that. Um, that also avoids any uh, unavailability downtime during a, during a, a normal rule, even without having to do a uh, failover. Um, cluster resizing is also a challenge. Um, so if you, uh, if you have a, a, a design where you have a, some sort of an explicit dynamic list of where everything is supposed to be, then you can kind of, uh, you can kind of update that once you've moved the files across. Um, but that becomes, that becomes another point of failure. So we've actually chosen to do uh, rendezvous hashing which means that we know kind of like where something is and also where it might have been previously if we know what the previous cluster configuration was. So we just look in both of those places. Um, and then uh, uh, that means that like when we do a cluster resize, we get a, a kind of a second chance. Um, and we don't actually, we actually like keep those on the, on the disk uh, for a while afterwards in order to, to maximize this. Um, and then obviously there's failure recovery. So uh, if you lose a machine, so it, like the i3n instances in uh, Amazon, for example, it takes, if you divide the uh, disk size by the network bandwidth um, and, the, and the disk I.O. bandwidth, it takes 48 minutes to reload the disk. So um, no matter what you do, a single machine can't actually like reload its data set in less than 48 minutes. Um, so the, the solution here is that we do whole cluster recovery. So if you have 100 machines, and after a recovery, you give each machine 1%, like each machine takes over 1% of the recovery process, now we've gone from 48 minutes to 48 divided by 100 uh, minutes, which is uh, uh, much better. Um, we actually even optimize that process by keeping track of the, uh, the, the most recently used files, so we download them first, um, so that the, the head of the LRU gets uh, recovered very quickly. Um, the, uh, the end result of all of this is that uh, we actually run like uh, a long time without any cache misses. Um, this, uh, this number is actually an accurate number. It was an accurate given the last time that I used this slide. Not, I didn't redo it this morning, but um, we, we run um, around six or seven nines of cache hit rate, which is kind of makes it look like an availability number. Um, and uh, it's, we actually get so few cache misses that it's wired up to an alarm. Uh, it's like it's a low priority alarm, but every cache miss gets investigated as a, as a, as a what happened. 
So um, I want to, uh, to kind of uh, summarize this and uh, the, the principles that we followed here have uh, enabled Rockset to do real-time indexing. So we get streaming ingest of uh, data from your, your, your confluent source or whatever, um, and we can make that data immediately visible. We can run a variety of types of queries over that with good performance. So we can run search-like queries with uh, high QPS and low latency. We can run uh, analytic queries that run, uh, we're not doing like, like any eight-hour jobs or whatever, but half an hour works fine. Um, and uh, we do all this while kind of exploiting the advantages of the cloud, uh, like the uh, raw CPUs and raw disks in, uh, in the cloud are, are more expensive than if you're running your own on-prem. So uh, if you just take uh, an existing design that works well for on-prem and you move it into the cloud, um, then you kind of end up overpaying. Um, so the, the principles here let us actually exploit the elasticity that we get in the cloud and S3, which is kind of a, uh, something that's difficult to build in your own data center. And then we do all this with full-featured SQL. So uh, even if you have a search like workload, you can still use joins. Uh, and uh, that gives you a lot of uh, flexibility in your product design and stuff like that. Um, as my last slide on here, I want to uh, plug uh, a conference that uh, Rockset is gonna host in November. So this is our first industry conference. Um, it's gonna be, it's a hybrid conference. So you can go in person at the Computer Museum in Mountain View, or you can, uh, uh, you can attend online. Uh, this is, uh, we have a really nice uh, slate of speakers uh, lined up, mostly talking about kind of what people have actually built with Rockset. Um, uh, I will probably put in a few kind of like, like how does Rockset actually work stuff. Um, and uh, this, this date, uh, November 2nd, actually it corresponds to uh, the 10, 10 year anniversary of uh, the creation of RocksDB.